Uh, my name is Stephen Meredy. I'm the head data scientist at Common Crawl. And uh, the interesting thing for me about Common Crawl is that we're actually a nonprofit, uh, very different to most of the companies here today. And our aim is to make web data accessible freely to anyone who wants it, whether that's startups, academia, industry. And the idea is each uh, crawl archive we end up releasing is billions of pages in size. So as an example, the February crawl archive was 1.9 billion web pages and about 150 terabytes uncompressed. And all of this, as I said, is released entirely free for you to use. We don't add any intellectual property restrictions to the data. So if you want to use it for, uh, say, a company, go ahead and use it. There's not a single restriction there. Additionally, all of this actually lives on Amazon public data sets. Uh, there are two advantages for that. First, they actually give us the hosting for free, which is amazing uh, advantage that we've got. But second, it means that if you, say, are uh, maybe a volunteer or just an interested student, you can spin up a cluster on Amazon with all of the data sitting right next to your compute infrastructure. Conversely, if you're, say, a company and you have your own metal, or if you're a um, university, and you're interested in getting this data, you can download it completely for free to your local cluster. We provide uh, three different file formats for the data that we produce. Uh, the first is called WAC, and it's just the raw responses themselves, which means it's the raw HTTP response headers and the raw responses, so the page content or the executable content. The second uh, file form we, format we provide is what, which is basically a JSON encoded file where we'll go through, say, a HTML page and extract the most important pieces of metadata, which might include HTML head data, the title of the page, any HTTP headers, and also all of the links on the page and all of the attributes that each of those links have. And finally, if, say, you're into natural language processing, we provide extracted text files. So we just pulled purely the text out of each and every one of those 1.9 billion web pages. To provide you a bit of a context as to how Common Crawl came about, how a nonprofit is here giving away data for free, um, we can kind of jump back to 2007, which was when it was founded by Gil Elbaz. So Gil uh, is the founder of Applied Semantics and Factual. And Applied Semantics, as some of you might know, was eventually acquired by Google. So he ended up going into Google in the fairly early days and looked at all of the amazing things they were using the web as a data set for. And the thing is, uh, in those days, if you wanted to use the web as a data set, you only really had a tiny set of options, basically a Google or a Microsoft. Uh, if you're an academic, you had to go and intern there or get a job there. And the issue with that is that data powers the algorithms in our field. It powers the analytics insights. It powers uh, the machine learning tasks that we run. It's something that everyone basically needs. And so his idea when he left was that he wanted to democratize and simplify access to the web as a data set to enable anyone to do that, whether they're startups or academics. So tackling the web as a data set is a challenge. Uh, data is malformed, data is scary, but the amazing thing is that there is so much out there for you to use. And when you kind of think of the web, it's always seen as largely unannotated, un which is entirely and utterly true. So you, usually you have to kind of look at it with a bit of an interesting lens. So the two different ways you can look at it is one, you can use the web data for unsupervised algorithms or analysis maybe an analytics task, maybe a natural language processing task where you don't need labeled data. The other is you can kind of take advantage of the fact that it is such a large data set to begin with. And if you filter it aggressively, uh, you can actually create large semi-annotated or annotated models. So basically add labeling in there. And the idea is that after even an incredibly aggressive filtering on such a large data set, you still have either hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes of data to play with. So instead of going into a single case study, I thought I'd go through a kind of range of case studies just because of the wide range of things that you can use the web for. So the first and kind of most obvious is analytics over how the web is and how it's composed. If you have an afternoon and you're actually interested, you can pull in Common Crawl, you can spin up a cluster on Amazon EC2 and look at JavaScript library usage across the web, HTML or HTML5 usage. Um, web server types and their age, or say RDFA, microdata, and microformat data sets. 
And all these you can do in basically an afternoon and a few dollars. As an example, one of the projects done uh, by CC and Wing was looking at the web domain um, across hundreds of billions of different domains and looking at the web servers that are actually used and how vulnerable they were from a security point of view. Uh, as we heard earlier today by the RSA guys, it's kind of a bit of a sad story. Um, you can see here that you have Apache, IIS, Nginx, and you can also quite rapidly see the versions that they're using. All of this information is sent back to you whenever you request a page on the internet, usually server um, headers in the HTTP headers themselves. And it's very, very trivial for you to actually pull up all of the CVE exploits and vulnerabilities and see just how amazingly fragile and amazingly, I guess, uh, dangerous it is to have all of these servers sitting out there considering their age. You can repeat the same sort of analysis for frameworks, for um, the use of JavaScript on the pages themselves. And all this, again, is available to you very quickly and very easily. So I also thought I'd talk about how uh, I actually got started with uh, Common Crawl. Uh, it was a few years ago, and uh, I was looking at how Google Analytics impacted the web. I wanted to know how many websites use Google Analytics, and also how much of a user's browsing history is actually captured by Google on a, say, daily basis. The first question had been tackled before in a few different ways. Usually, it's looking at the top 10,000 domains. So for the top 10,000 domains, about 65% use Google Analytics, all the way down to, say, the top million domains, where about 50% use Google. Now, that's already a fairly large amount, but no one really kind of asked the question, how much further does that extend? And they certainly didn't ask the question, if people were randomly clicking around the internet, if you had like a hyperlink graph of the web and you know, knew which pages had Google Analytics and which didn't, how much of a user's browsing history ended up being leaked to Google? So at the end of uh, my analysis, I ended up finding that about 30% of the 48 million domains in the Common Core corpus that we analyzed used uh, Google Analytics. And that's you know, a very large proportion, especially considering how many domains that covers. The fact is also that it was about 40% of the 500 million web pages that I analyzed had Google Analytics on it. And most importantly of all, about 50% of the 42 billion links that I ended up looking at leaked data either at the start or at the end to Google. Um, so basically, this sort of analysis isn't possible if you just crawl a few pages randomly. You need to have a full capture, a full snapshot of the web to understand how uh, extreme some of these um, potential situations are. It's not something you can capture in just kind of the short tail. Of. So all of this, uh, you could either recreate yourself. You could go through and grab our data and uh, pull out all of the links and uh, process the HTML in that way. But that's obviously a lot of work. One of the great things that we've seen is derived data sets from the Common Core corpus itself. And from that, we have the Web Data Commons hyperlink graph. Web Data Commons is a group that is entirely independent of us. They just take our data and do amazing things with it, mostly uh, composed of a number of universities. And so they produced the largest freely available real-world graph data set in 2012, which is 3.6 billion web pages and 128 billion links. Um, for many of you, uh, 128 billion links is a ridiculously large graph data set. Um, we haven't been able to find anything publicly larger than it. Um, we do know that some corporations have a larger data sets, such as Facebook, for example, but none of that data will come out. What's also interesting is that you can actually analyze, even though this is an amazingly large data set, the tools are now there for us to be able to perform a full analysis of it. So Data Graph Lab, Create, uh, as I announced this morning, they can use a single EC2 in instance, and you can get this for cents an hour. They use a single EC2 instance to get under, well, they said nine minutes this morning because they keep improving it, but nine minutes per page rank iteration, which means you can do, say, a full 30 page rank iteration in only a few hours. This is really quite game changing as far as analyzing the web at scale, analyzing how pages connect to each other across the web. So the other area, especially of my interest, is machine learning um, and how you can use the web for that. And one of the easiest things you can do is basically count the number of times you see certain uh, usages of language across the web. And that's called n-gram counts. Um, so how many times a specific phrase, such as the cat sat on the map, um, is really useful if you then apply it to language models. 
Uh, you can then use that for, say, Apple Siri to work out what is more likely when you talk into it, um, so to improve speech recognition, or to improve machine translation when you're translating from one, machine, uh, one language to another. One of the most exciting things is that we're able to start replicating and recreating work that was, again, previously only available within these powerhouses of uh, computing. So the N Google Ngram dataset, commonly called Web1T, was a dataset released in, I think it was about 2006, which was composed of one trillion tokens of text. With the uh, common crawl Ngram corpus, they were able to produce 975 billion deduplicated tokens. And the deduplicated part is somewhat important because um, there are a few disadvantages to the Google Ngrams corpus. The first is that they didn't include low count entries, so words that just didn't appear enough times to really capture their interest. And the second is that they didn't do deduplication to reduce boilerplate. You can imagine certain phrases such as contact us across the web are really, really quite pervasive and would quite strongly skew any language model. The other disadvantage was that Google had actually created a deduplicated version of the Google Web1T corpus, but they only shared it within limited contexts, and it wasn't publicly released. If you're an academic and you wanted to recreate someone's work, the data isn't there for you. Worse, the data isn't even able to be recreated by you without it. So with the Common Call Ngram corpus, you can actually go ahead and recreate a corpus that is quite similar yourself um, outside in academia or, or industry. So to give you an idea, we're talking about like terabytes of each of these different languages. Um, this is before deduplication. It decreases somewhat after. But still, we're talking about 42 languages with over 10 gigabytes of data and 73 languages with over 1 gigabyte. And many of these are really quite rare languages um, that you wouldn't commonly expect to see at scale across the web. Best of all is that when you actually apply these to a lot of machine learning tasks, it ends up making a big difference. So a quote from the paper is that even though the web data is quite noisy, even limited amounts give improvements. Uh, specifically, their example was in an English to Spanish uh, translation task. And they did it for a number of different languages as well. So the more raw text you can throw at these machine learning algorithms, generally the better they do. Again, the idea that data powers our industry and that without open data sets, it's not really a, a fair playing field. You can go even further than that, and that, oh, before I mention, um, the Ngram and language models are also another derived data set. You can actually download all of these yourself. You don't need to go through Common Core Corpus and reproduce them. So if you're interested in raw text split by language, deduplicated text, or the resulting language models themselves, all of these are available for you to download and to use for free. Um, and you can just basically throw that into whatever task you're using and get immediate advantages from it. So one of the coolest uh, usages of the common crawl uh, text corpus is glove, or global vectors for word representation. The idea is instead of representing a word as the textual string that you see it as, instead you represent it as a string of bits. And those bits actually encompass some of the meaning of those words. So if you take the word vector for king, subtract man, and add woman, it should be approximately equal to the word vector for queen. So being able to actually introduce these into machine learning models uh, basically really quite trivially improves a number of uh, tasks for their performance. These are some two-dimensional uh, uh, projections of this sort of work. And you can see along the top, it's all uh, feminine nouns, and along the bottom, it's all masculine nouns. So that kind of structure is basically captured within these word vectors themselves. And the same thing occurs for verbs. So slow, slower, and slowest is in a similar structure as short, shorter, and shortest. With this, you can ask a few interesting questions if you're, say, a natural language processing person. And that would be uh, semantic questions, such as Athens is to Greece as Berlin is to Germany, or syntactic questions as dance is to dancing as fly is to flying. The most interesting thing, in my opinion, uh, with this work is that they actually show that even though the web is a noisy data set, that the more you can provide, the better the result is. They compare it to Wikipedia, which Wikipedia is an amazingly well-curated data set, um, beautifully structured, beautifully contained, but it is really quite small in the grand scheme of things. And so Wikipedia does quite well on the semantic task, which you could imagine it would. It's mainly factual in the questions that it asks. 
but it doesn't do so well in syntactic tasks. Common Crawl, however, being about 42 times the size of the Wikipedia corpus, does substantially better in the syntactic uh, task, but it also does better in the semantic task as well. So it still actually captures a lot of factual information across the web. And it captures a lot of things that Wikipedia wouldn't allow within it because Wikipedia is that kind of constrained and clean data set. So as with before, um, all of this data is actually freely available for you to use. You can download pre-trained models to throw in whatever machine learning algorithm you've got, and you can also download the source code itself and reproduce the work. And best of all, the performance keeps improving with the more data you throw at it. This is a perfect task for something like uh, the web as a data set. And finally, one of my uh, favorite examples, just because it is so ridiculously simple, is dirt cheap web scale parallel text. And the idea was really quite simple. All they did was they processed all of the URLs of the style website.com slash a language code. And then they looked in to check whether or not there was the same URL with just a language code replaced. So w.com slash en slash Tesla and w.com slash fr slash Tesla. And then assumed that that was an English and French version of the page. When you have uh, the same text available in two different languages, we call that parallel text. And you can feed that to machine learning algorithms. And basically, that's the way that we get machine translation. So their quote was, with nothing more than a set of common two-letter language codes, they mined 32 terabytes in just under a day. They spun up an EC2 cluster, um, threw their algorithms at the data, and they were done. So they ended up with a very large amount of data across a, a wide variety of languages. Um, through to things like Farsi, Telugu, Somali, Kanadu. Uh, these languages are things that's really quite hard to get parallel text for um, because it's such a, an intensive task to actually get someone to translate um, a page of language to, from one to the other. The other advantage with using the web for this kind of work is that the traditional data sets they use for parallel text, Europarl and United Nations, are really, really constrained in the sorts of topics that they speak about. They'll speak about trade, they'll speak about um, government policies, but they won't speak about, uh, say, hair care products or um, car trips or vacations. Common Crawl covers this really quite well just because it's a snapshot of the web. It's a snapshot of the largest corpus in kind of human history. And so what they end up finding was that they parallel text that they provided uh, reduce, uh, produced uh, improved results on standard test data sets usually along the lines of newswire, so things you'd read in a newspaper. But if you tested it outside of the newswire domain, the improvements were far more substantial. Overall, though, I mean, the idea is that they took a very simple idea, an enormous data set, and with minimal cleaning and filtering, they were able to get substantial improvements in their statistical machine, machine translation task. And they ended up looking at the data in the end uh, with manual inspection across three of the languages and found about 80% of the data contained good translations. And this is a, the sort of thing that Google used uh, the web as a data set for initially to power their machine translation system. This is the sort of thing that you'd want in uh, academia or in industry if you would like to actually produce a tool that has the same sort of um, result. And finally, filtering and aggregation, which is, uh, I guess, a simpler version than, say, the machine learning work, but really quite interesting as well. Um, one idea is uh, gazetteers. It's basically lists of concepts or lists of uh, relations. And the idea is to use web tables for gazetteers and relations. This was originally done with Google Sets uh, many years ago, ago as part of the Google Labs project. Unfortunately, it was uh, basically shut down. But the idea is you could query cat, and it would return dog, bird, horse, rabbit, a bunch of pets. But if you instead queried cat and ls, it would understand that you're querying Unix tools and return cd, head, cut, and vim. So how do they do this? Uh, basically, they cheated. They looked at millions and millions and millions of web tables and tried to find relations within those web tables to use. We can do the same thing. So Web Data Commons again, a brilliant team, they went ahead and they actually extracted 11.2 billion tables from uh, the Common Crawl corpus and then filtered it down to keep the relational tables via a train classifier. Even though they ended up basically removing almost all of the corpus, they only had 1.3% of the original data remaining, it's still a hugely valuable resource because it was 147 million web tables in size. And if you actually look at the popular column headers, it is exactly the sort of thing you would want for a machine learning task. 
So name, title, artist, location, model, manufacturer, country. And as with all the data before, they've released it entirely and utterly freely for you to download. And for me, the, the one which I absolutely love is one of the examples they have is camera models. And I'm, I'm, I'm a photographer, I love photography, but even I have trouble decoding some of these camera models sometimes, let alone if you were, say, asking a, a machine learning uh, parser to look through language and actually work out which was and wasn't uh, camera models. So all of this you can grab immediately and start using uh, in your own projects. And the final example um, is one that's kind of near and dear in my heart because it, it shows just how simple this is to actually get working, to get up and off the ground and have these amazing results. So Yelp, um, fairly large American uh, startup, uh, they basically decided to ask the question, let's use Common Crawl to help match businesses from Yelp's database to the possible web pages for the, those businesses on the internet. So one of the issues they had was they had a huge number of uh, phone numbers, US phone numbers, but they didn't necessarily have the business's uh, web pages to go along with it. So they ended up extracting 748 million US phone numbers from the Common Crawl December 2014 corpus. And that was with a very simple regular expression over the extracted text, uh, so just of wet files. Now, how simple was it? The total complexity was 134 lines of Python. The total time was one hour. And the total cost was just under $11 USD. And that was using Elastic MapReduce. If you rolled your own Hadoop uh, cluster, that would even be cheaper. And they ended up testing it internally, and it matched against uh, Yelp's database. 48% of the time, it had an exact URL match for the business uh, that was listed, and 61% of the time it had a matching domain. And so they actually released all of the, well, 134 lines of code um, and more details on exactly what they did on their blog post, analyzing the web for the price of a sandwich. But the thing that is really fascinating for me is that $11 is within the price range of an interested volunteer or just a hobbyist. Uh, $11 is something that you know, people will go out and spend, as just said, on a, a sandwich. And some people have actually gone out and done amazing works in the same sort of way. We've had someone who analyzed how Wikipedia is linked to from across the web um, simply as a weekend project. And they did it for $60 and found 34 million links from the web linking into Wikipedia. And that by itself is an amazing corpus. So, with all these derived data sets, you don't even have to necessarily uh, tackle the raw data that we end up releasing. The raw data and the metadata and the extracted text that we have is really quite useful in and of itself. But if your task matches one of the ones already done, they're happily there to give you the data without you having to even process it at all. And there are so many interesting use cases for the web as a data set that it's, it always gets me excited when I start talking about it. And the thing is, Open data is catching on. It's being used in a wide variety of areas, and people keep giving back when they produce these new data sets. Um, we truly do believe that it's evened out the playing field for academia and industry. You can see from all these examples, a lot of them Google, um, they've basically created uh, open and free examples of uh, these previously proprietary data sets that anyone can use, that anyone can use to bootstrap a startup or to bootstrap an academic project. Uh, there's just so many different possible use cases for all of these things. And really, we just released this base data set, and all of these brilliant people build on it. So I'd like to encourage you, uh, the other brilliant people in the room, um, to basically have a look. And if you've got time, play around with the web as a data set. It has so many different possibilities, and you really are the sort of people who can push it to the next level. So if you're interested in reading more, there's commoncrawl.org. And I'll also uh, send a link to the slides on our Twitter account this afternoon. Thanks.